Hi, and welcome to episode 17 of Metastatic Modernity. I'm Tom Murphy, and in this episode, we'll take another step in our effort to synthesize the lessons from this series into a more appropriate way to see ourselves as human members within Earth's community of life. But let me be clear from the start, I didn't lay the foundation of the last 16 episodes in order to roll out my secret plan. I don't have some hidden agenda, a fix-all recipe, some brilliant vision all worked out. This isn't, after all, a TED Talk. Um, it's not megachurch infotainment. I'm just as confused as anybody and willing to admit that. The one thing I'm pretty clear on, though, is that we can't go on like this. Something seismic has to change. I'm going to try and address the question, who are we anyway, by way of a series of questions that are all about, could you even exist without fill in the blank? Okay, so the first one is pretty easy. Could you even exist without the sun? I think, hell no. I mean, it's the source of energy for virtually all life on Earth. Could you exist without atoms, rocks, gravity, electromagnetism? Well, we can't do anything without atoms and all the relationships between them. Rocks plus gravity makes the Earth and Earth makes us. How about could you exist without breathable air, drinkable water? Well, we'd be dead within minutes without breathable air and within days without drinkable water. So that's a no. Could you exist without continents, oceans, rivers? And this might be a bit more of a stretch, require more work to connect. But I think you'd be foolish to propose the counterfactual that those aren't at all important to us. They're, after all, integral and important elements in our complete context. How about microbes? Could you exist without microbes? And I'm not just talking about the um, considerable evolutionary heritage that we, we have from the microbes, but the microbes living today, performing countless essential ecological services, and even within our own guts. Could you exist without the primary energy source uh, of photosynthesis? I mean, this is what powers most life, con converting uh, essential sunlight into chemical energy. So we're talking about plants and trees and plankton and algae and the ferns in the background of this image. Could you exist without fungi and their networks? Um, they, after all, perform crucial nutrient cycling and form these essential symbiotic relationships with plants, and so the plants don't work if the fungi aren't there. Could you exist without the worms and insects who perform soil maintenance and pollination, nutrient cycling, and form a critical food base? How about, could you exist without any of the wild groups of fish and birds and reptiles and mammals? And I think if you take any group out, you risk collapse of the ecology. These members of the community of life are all evolved in the full context of each other in an intricate web of interdependent reciprocal relationships. We don't have to understand for it to be true. The universe doesn't check in with us latecomers first before trying something. The newt doesn't know cognitively all the dependencies it lives by, but there they are all the same. You could muse about whether we really need some component of the community of life, but what do your musings stack up to compared to the wisdom of evolutionary vetting in a fully parallel, fully contextual ecological reality over deep time? So you might muse about the importance of some ecological strand, but as Dirty Harry might put it, do you feel lucky, punk? Monkey? I'll let that go. Uh, a, a big part of what I'm trying to convey uh, here is that we're really nothing without, you know, fill in the blank. We couldn't exist without a huge list of entities, beings, and relationships. Uh, really makes no sense to talk of a human being apart from the whole that it's embedded within. That's just not a thing. It never has been and never will be. To make it maybe a bit more personal, you are not you without everything. It makes no sense to consider yourself as being separate somehow from the web of life. Maybe think of a squirrel as a fruiting body in a healthy forest, one glorious and genius part of a whole. And likewise, you are an extension of what's all around you. Just because you're unaware of all the connections doesn't mean they're not present and vital. We're all connected by physics, atoms, nutrients, 
origins, DNA, countless relationships, and you're one of many simultaneously existing biophysical expressions complete with a heritage and a present day set of dependencies that reach deep into the Earth's past, present, and even future. So as some of the earlier episodes emphasize, we own almost nothing about ourselves. Biological features like replication, metabolism, muscle, bone, our senses, neurons, and the brain were all invented before us and basically just copy-pasted with minor tweaks to make us. And as part of that, our brains are mostly heritage. The same neurons are shared across the animal kingdom. We share brain structures with worms for heartbeats and vital functions and with reptiles for basic survival instincts, small mammals for the limbic system and emotions, and larger mammals for the cerebrum. Our thoughts are shaped and constrained by the structure of our brains, and that structure is part of our heritage, so that in a way, human thoughts are not even wholly our own. So if we don't even own ourselves, we certainly don't own the earth. We're not its masters. We're not made to rule. That mythology is pretty diluted. Um, Now, if we're lucky and well-behaved, earth might let us belong to it for a while longer anyway. Okay, so what do you notice about these three words? Humility, humble, human. Right, they all start with H-U-M. But modernity is this big hubbub based on hubris. So really, maybe we should call the denizens of modernity humans. And as self-centered as we are, maybe we're human beings. Uh, it's just a problem of letter placement, really. It's all been one comedic and tragic dyslexic mix-up. But humor aside, let's aim to be humans, embracing humility and humbleness. Is it up to us? Well, our actions certainly influence our fate, and the fate of many other species along with us, but we're constrained by ecological realities. This is not some arbitrary game. We can't set whatever rules we like. We're best off as students of other life, taking cues on how to live ecologically in reciprocal relationship, integrated into a web of life. It's not easy. It's kind of an alien way of thinking to humans anyway, but humans of the past did manage it. A common theme in indigenous cultures is that our older brothers and sisters in this world, the plants and animals, have much to teach us about how to live. So this isn't primitive animism, but hard-earned wisdom that works in practice. Okay, so next time I'll wrap up the series by trying to answer the frequently asked question, what can I do? And I'll just... Uh, share that I worry that my failure to deliver on this front will make for a lame ending to the series, but I'll do my best. And in the meantime, please check out the companion write-up to this episode at the Do The Math blog, dothemath.ucsd.edu. Until next time.